everyone, welcome to another episode of Smash or Pass with JB, hey. me Millie, and of course Smash. Hello! So in today's episode we are going to be taking a look and reviewing Scooby-Doo Adventures, the mystery map. So for those of you who, like me and JB, hadn't seen this one or haven't seen this one for a while, this is the really kind of unique puppet style movie that was made. Um, it centers around a pirate ship and a treasure map and they the gang want to try and find the treasure and they have to kind of contend with the contend with the bird that perhaps wants to take the treasure map from them it's like quite an interesting story but it certainly is one of the kind of shorter movies um in the like i said there's like just kind of like the main plot of the bird takes the map they want to get the map back and then they want to find the treasure that's I want to say a very brief summary. Anything you want to add? I guess just stuff? some context around this. Am I right in saying that this is not Mindy Cohn as Velma, but in fact Stephanie de Abruzzo? Abruzzo? Yes. So that's change up there. very interesting. Do we know why that change was made? Is this where Mindy Cohn kind of leaves the series, or is Mindy Cohn back in the next movie for stage for it? Um, no, so there's quite a bit of behind the scenes with this one. I don't know if you want to jump into that. Yeah, yet. of course. Context um, kind of is the most important thing before we get started on the actual movie. So take it away. This is about to make us feel bad, Jamie. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, this movie is very unique, very different, came out of nowhere. Uh, so, yeah, it's a different Velma voice. And this movie, I believe, came out once the Mystery Incorporated series had finished. So, uh, you know, they were, yes. And so they were, you know, in this, like, uh, limbo period of, you know, now we don't have a series going on. What's going to be the next one type of thing? Because Be Cool Scooby-Doo didn't start coming out until two years after. So, uh, at Mindy Cohn still does Velma for a handful of movies going forward. But what this was, was this was actually a backdoor pilot uh, for a puppet series that they wanted to do. They wanted to, you know, have this whole Scooby-Doo series where it was puppetry and this movie was supposed to be, uh, you know, act as the pilot for the series and get potential. Um, they took this movie actually to Comic-Con, like THE Comic-Con that year. They had Matthew Lillard there and a bunch of the other stars and uh, the Puppet Masters and whatever. And um, yeah, so they were they were hyping this movie up. They were trying to get attention so that they could uh, greenlight this series. But as I'm sure we'll discuss this movie bombed very hard and so um they oh, basically no. said like cancel all production for this series act like it was never even a thing we're not doing a series and so that's when they were like okay we're doing be cool scooby-doo so yeah never guessed it from watching the movie oh no right yeah <laughs> um. <laughs> The first comment I have about the movie is good, and then it may go down from hill rapidly. <laughs> well, I guess question there. then. Did Mindy Cohn just not want to commit themselves to, like, a puppet show? Or was... I, I From what I understand, this um, actor... Who was it? Was it this Stephanie de Abruzzo is known for kind of their voice acting in puppetry. Was it just kind of a name that they wanted to use to bring in, I guess, puppet fans, fans of other puppeting media? You know, it was that's kind of a hard topic to really pin down on what was going on because um, the the whole reason that like Mindy Cohn actually stepped down from Velma, you know, in a few years is because she was diagnosed with cancer, and so they had to, obviously, like, that's priority. Uh, and then, luckily, she was able to get it taken care of, and she's, you know, as of this moment, is alive and doing well. 
Um, she, there's rumors that she's asked to come back as Velma, but the thing is, you have to know, like, realize that, you know, Kate Micucci is doing Velma now, like, she's signed into contracts, you know, they can't just be like, oh, Mindy's good and well, let's just replace Kate now, you know, again and stuff, you know, it's a whole, like, legal thing, they can't just swap out here and there, so, um, my kind of guess, I mean, yeah, maybe they, they wanted someone, you know, who did puppet voices to come, you know, get into this, but I'm also wondering if this was at the point where her cancer scare started, and so she wanted to step away from series, but was like, I'll come in, you know, occasionally for these movies, because, you know, for to do a movie rather than a series, you know, a movie, I would guess, is maybe, maybe at max, like, a month's worth of sitting in the booth, if that, really. Whereas, you know, a series, that's going to be a weekly thing that she has to sit and go do and stuff. So I'm wondering if at this point she was ready to step down from doing Velma, but was still willing to do some of the movies. And so, you know, when they thought that this was going to be a series, they were like, okay, well, let's have the new Velma, you know, be Velma in this uh, show, this movie. But then obviously it didn't take off. Yeah, I mean... That topic in itself, in terms of the like voice of Velma, is an entire like conversation to be had. Like I remember, reco- like re- uh, reacting to Sword and the Scoob on your channel, and um, Velma's Velma's voice just, it took me a minute. Yes, that's, that's <laughs> all I kind of have to say. So if if Mindy wants to return, then you know it'd be great to see uh, to see a familiar face come back to the voice, like. Behind the voice and stuff. Although I guess in fairness to us at that point, our primary source of Scooby Media was either Linda Cardellini or I want to say even BJ Ward. And I think BJ Ward played it with a very almost deep voice. Like they kind of came mm-hmm. at it with the kind of the point of view of like a wise librarian, I want to say. Whereas Mikuchi was good. She's definitely grown on me. Came at it with that very squeaky approach. Mm-hmm. It was like going from one end of the spectrum to the other one. So I guess it was quite jarring. And I certainly think Velma's voice yeah. has had the most variety throughout. Like obviously Frank Welk has just been such a consistent you know, backing for Fred. Um, I think that even when there's been exchanges for the Shaggy voice, it's been done, like, really, I want to say respectful. Like, I feel like every actor behind it has had some level of respect for the previous one. They've wanted to kind of take it, maybe make it their own slightly, but I think there's been a lot of consistency. Yeah, loads. Whereas I think with Velma and Daphne, there's been a few changes and I just think the Velma one certainly had the most range. Yeah. Yes, Velma... Um, that's fine. Sorry, go ahead. No, no, after you, so... Oh, no, I was just going to say that Velma is the one out of the core five that's had the most uh, voice actresses, you know, portray her. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, she's also been the one that's had the most, like, uh, harder voices for people to get used to. Uh, one that, like, everybody can say they, you know, it's one of those, we do not speak of her as Marla Frumpkin. If you know who she is and when she played Velma, ooh, you know her voice very well. And, you know, if if you ever, like, watch the that time period where she's portraying Velma, you try to rush those episodes as fast as you can. Hmm, I can't say I'm familiar with them, to be honest. Here, I'll send you a compilation of Marla <laughs> Pumpkin as Velma. You will just love it. Oh, wait till we're reacting to series, JB. Oh. But I feel like some of what Smash was saying earlier makes sense. Like, this movie we found was really difficult to find. It's clear they don't make more copies of this now. It was certainly, like, three or four times the price of the other movies that we've been picking up to react to. It's it's very clear that this one's kind of been swept under the carpet and hidden hidden away. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so weird. Like we could have we ordered say you can order a DVD from WH Smith's be it Zombie Island, Cyber Chase, even some of the newer ones like Abracadabra, Happy Halloween for Literally like three pounds. Three pounds if that. Whereas this one we had to get from Kex, which is like a second hand like shop here. And I think it was about 
either, it was either eight or twelve pounds. It was wild in comparison to to the older ones of their time period. Obviously, you know, Sword and the Scoob and obviously Courage now is still about twelve pounds, but it was just so crazy because I'd have thought that even if it was received badly, they would have made a similar amount of dvds although i guess it's like a print run for a book right if they sell out the first wave they then print more you know issue another wave and if they just don't sell that first one then there's no need to produce more but or if they don't want it to be um thin publicly and ridiculed then they may just not make enough of it i mean, maybe not maybe not but it's the question, like, did they genuinely believe that they were producing something that would be received well? Like, because I don't think they've made it with bad intention, and I think that's something that I'll go on to summarise later on, but it's like, it, a part of me feels that they didn't just go in, like, if they didn't make an animated movie just as puppets, they made a full-on puppet film with puppet tropes and kind of puppet set pieces. They were fully all on board with this. And a part of me kind of thinks, well, what gave them the confidence that it would take off? Like, they didn't have a particularly, you know, big new name to shout it out as a USP to people. There wasn't evidence in the past that puppets would really take off. It was just kind of weird, you know? And one of my questions is, if they were planning on making this a series, did they invest a lot more money in the puppets and stuff than they would have done if it was just for a movie, just to then have that kind of fall through? Yeah, I mean, it must have cost a bit. It's it's weird, but I guess we'll probably get on to yeah, the first let's scene. Yeah, make a little start on the movie. So, I like the pirate ship at the start. I always like water and boats, and I was a bit like, oh, yay. Yeah. I'm happy. It was it was actually really nice. I don't know how they did it, but instantly I'm thinking that it's one of the most cinematically pleasing ones because you've kind of got the nice flowing water, the visual of that boat in itself, mm -hmm. and it actually seems really good. It almost seemed uh, almost like a level up of animation. So obviously it wasn't animation, but it reminded me of like the start of like a How to Train Your Dragon movie yeah. with that kind of scope of things, and so. It, it was kind of good impressions throughout, even down to the title sequence. But I suppose, oh, Smash, what what was your initial interpretation of the first few seconds? Like Literally just the pirate yeah, ship just... moving across. Okay, so I have to say, uh, when this one came out, I was just like, nope, like, mm -hmm. not dealing with that one, it doesn't exist, you know, like, moving on. And so I didn't watch it for at least a few years afterwards because it, it came out in 2013. And so I was like just getting into high school around that time. And then uh, I didn't watch it until after I graduated high school, actually. And uh, I didn't get the DVD at first. I watched it uh, here in America. We have a boomerang streaming service because, you know, there's the boomerang channel. But we have a streaming service dedicated to Boomerang, and uh, they added it there. And I was like, oh, well, I'll watch it since I don't have to, you know, technically pay for it. Yeah. And so one day I was just like, okay, we're going to turn this on. I'm going to watch it, just, like, see what this even was. At this point, it was probably a good, like, four years old or something. Um, and so, you know, I watched it then. I do own it now just because, you know, I'm... A Scooby Doo freak and need to have the complete collection for me to feel satisfied. But um, yeah, when I originally started watching this, um, I really didn't know what to expect. I mean, I had seen the trailer and stuff, but I. Uh, and so I did get the vibe because they really went more a pup named Scooby Doo with this show. They, you know, they made the characters younger and they look like their pup named Scooby Doo. Uh, designs and stuff um but just seeing this i was like oh okay so like we're really going into this uh pirate aspect of it you know we hadn't seen really a pirate movie since pirates ahoy which was at this point you know years ago and so it got me a little excited just seeing it because to be honest i i kind of thought like a lot of the movie i mean yes the whole movie is fake but like even just, like, that water scene, you know, I thought it would have been some sort of, like, 
paper waves or something, you know? And I was like, oh, this is kind of cool. You know, the scenery looks interesting, at least. So that was kind of my initial, like... I, I was I was a little impressed with the scenery, at the very least. Yeah, I would agree. And then also, it then, like, pans over to a treehouse. And I was still there with it. I was like, oh, well, if we're doing the younger thing, they're a bit... They, you know, they're not the teenagers they are normally. It is quite a cute concept to have a treehouse painted like the Mystery Machine. I kind of like that as well. Yeah, and I really liked... Because I, I tend to pick up on music as well. And I, like, heard an instrumental of the Summertime song from Camp Scare. And I'm like, yeah. oh, okay. So this is getting me into the kind of holiday vibe. Obviously, they've shown water. So I'm expecting something almost tropical. And still, even when we initially see the puppets, I'm not annoyed, I'm not, like, hacked off, because I think it starts with Fred doing, like, weights in a mirror, mm -hmm. and I guess this is something that I want to make absolutely clear. I, hand on heart, believe that the puppeteers and the kind of set design behind this movie should be praised, because the amount of skill that it must take to make it all move and to make it all flow is something that I really wish I could do, and it, it is definitely something that is is really talented. Now, whether that's applied in terms of writing is a different story, but initially, I'm just kind of freaking out, going, oh my gosh, I wish that I was on this set, I wish I could explore the set pieces and see the puppets, so from that aspect, I'm I'm happy. JB and I are about to have a game of good cop, bad cop, because he, he can balance it out so that we can hopefully get people to interview on the channel again. And I'm going to be, like, relatively blunt. From the second the puppets were introduced, I hated it. Like, I didn't like the weightlifting thing. Why have they aged him down on his weightlifting? Then Daphne does this really weird thing where she's keeping all her shoes in a communal treehouse. They're magically moving on their own. Oh no, come on, that and was I'm good, because like, that's so oh, Daphne. Oh gosh, why, <laughs> why, 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 why? And then they start talking. And I think it's because I've not seen a pup named Scooby-Doo. I've only do really bad, watched, like, the bad, things do. where they are teenagers and stuff. But even the voices, I was just like, oh, okay. Got some adjusting to do here. It's not just the visual. It's not just the visual. There's 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 noises. It's It's very, it's very, very different. This is a lot to deal with. Then Matthew Lillard is is Matthew Lillard is Shaggy in this one? Yeah, yeah? the only the yeah. only difference he is started speaking, Velma. and the second he started speaking, I was so relaxed again because for me they didn't change their voice in this. Everyone else tried to age down, and they still sounded like Shaggy. Scooby still sounded like Scooby, and then I was a bit like, if I close my eyes, I can manage this movie. Just from Matthew mm, Lillard's voice, yeah. for me he was like. For me, it was like this grounding that was like, okay, this is still Scooby Doo. This is Shaggy. This sounds like Shaggy. I understand. Mm, Just yeah. because for me, like, to see the different art style, to hear the different voices, it was, and like I said, this weird little thing where Daphne's shoes were moving and Fred was weightlifting. I was just like, oh, wow, this is a lot. I'm not seeing anything that's very similar to where we left it with the last movie. So it literally just took Matthew Lillard's voice to be like, okay, I found something I recognise. Yeah, I get what you're saying. And I guess it is a bit like a pup named Scooby-Doo in that sense. Because from what I can remember, I think every single one of that kind of voice cast was different except for Shaggy and Scooby again. I think yep. they were still Casey Case, And so it makes complete sense that you would have the familiar Shaggy. So in a way, they've done an excellent job replicating a pup named Scooby-Doo. But once again, I'm kind of going back to the initial question of if a pup named Scooby-Doo was nostalgic and beloved, why not just make a series that's a sequel to that and instead of taking such a risk because here's something that i think the movie can be commended on as well and this isn't and obviously i'm trying to come up with the most positive things that i can say because again one thing that i appreciate is they definitely weren't lazy with the concept like they were doing fine i guess they're still doing fine making two two movies animated movies a year alongside a tv show occasionally like there was no reason for them to invest in puppets and to even try something different and so the fact that they have is 
is amazing and I do appreciate that. So it definitely wasn't a lazy choice, but this was the first DVD that we picked up and I was actively irritated at, at you know, how lazy the production outside of the movie was in that obviously, you know, the last couple of movies, you've had some bonus episodes of um, the TV show and they had that here as well. But it's like, because they did something so different this time, there's puppets, they've built big set pieces, they've built individual characters, and there's no behind the scenes look at how they did it. And and I was just like, well, that, that annoyed me. You literally just wasted it. Like, come on, if you're not getting the series out from it, at least get us a good bonus feature. Like, this is the puppet. Like, they could have had a bonus feature that I would have rewatched, or I would have put this disc back in for just for the bonus features, and they just didn't do it. And it, it's just annoying. It really does annoy me that they didn't do that. So it was the first DVD that I picked up, and I thought, okay, they've just stopped putting any effort into the bonus features. But Yeah, because these have games and everything, didn't they? Yeah, and... I guess with the others, they had no reason to really do bonus features apart from maybe a couple of interviews. But this was the one film that they really could have done something special with, and they just didn't. So yeah, that's just a massive. Show. Or even just the kind of silly things that they used to do with, um, with the like Goblin King had like a little magician scene. Samurai Sword had ninjutsu. This could have at least have had how to make your own puppet or how to control a mannequin or how to do ventriloquism. It could have had some kind of out there guest star doing that and it would have been at least a bit of personality to it. But as it is, just absolutely lazy. So with that, I think that's probably all the real praise that I've got left for this movie. But maybe my notes will reflect differently. <laughs> I guess what we're up to is they find the treasure map. And also, I guess I wanted to talk about the outfits. Like you said, they're very, like, a pup named Scooby-Doo. Kind of not a fan of Velma's, just because, like, it changes to, like, white and yellow. It's a bit of a step away. Did you notice anything about the outfits, JB, or was it just all like, yeah? I mean, I like Velma's glasses. I kind of yeah. feel like that added in a bit of, like, quirkiness to them. And all of the others, I think they were just very accurate to a pup named Scooby-Doo, which I was not too familiar with, but I don't have any real issue with it, apart from just, I guess, yeah, you're right, Velma's outfit. But the glasses I liked, I think yeah. it added a bit more zaniness to them that I liked. Now, I'm going to say that the movie takes a very, I want to say, goofy turn the second they leave the treehouse. You know how Smash was like, oh, I was expecting, like, paper waves and stuff? To me, that's what happens when it's like this person pops up from nowhere and Velma's just like, take this to the lab. And then there's all <laughs> these yellow stars flashing around because somebody's bumped their head. It's like, oh, 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 I hate this style. Oh, gosh. Like, no. I just I just wasn't, like, I wasn't engaging with it at, at all at that point. No, well... Uh, Okay, I guess in context, we both grew up on very different shows. I am almost nostalgic watching this to an extent, a limited extent, because I did used to watch shows like this when I was maybe five, six, seven years old. I mean, to put it in context, I've never seen an episode of The Muppets. I've never seen, until I met JB, did you say Coraline's puppetry? It's a bit like, kind of, it's a bit like puppetry. It's puppetry I'd, style, which I do I'd like. I've never seen that before. What's the other one that you like? Like that's... Nightmare Before Christmas yeah, is a bit never like never seen that. that before. My parents didn't like animated stuff, so puppetry would have just driven them insane. So <laughs> I just, yeah, I'd never seen anything like this. And um, maybe that maybe that's why I was like just struggling with it, but I didn't like it. I mean, Smash. What what's your experience yeah. of watching puppetry? Or and what did you think when you saw the yellow like flashy stars and stuff? So I think okay. So first off, on the puppet side of things, I really don't watch a whole lot of puppet stuff. Um, there. Were, I mean, sure. You know, I saw a little bit of like the Muppets growing up. And then obviously there's a show, the uh, Sesame Street, that I you know had watched growing up a lot. And then uh, here in America there was a show, and maybe maybe it was over there, and maybe they brought it over here. I don't know. Anyway, there was a show that we'd always watch in school too, um, called Between the Lions. That was puppetry, 
And so I was used to it, but I never was like in love with it. You know, it was just like one of those, oh, it's a, it's a style of show, you know. But oftentimes I feel like they use puppetry for kids shows. Uh, but then, you know, on the side of just Scooby-Doo, I think for me personally, I went into this with more the eyes of a pup named Scooby-Doo. And so, you know, while it does seem odd, you know, that like uh, the random guy you're like running into the screen to take Velma's swab or whatever and then running away, um, that happened a ton in a pup named Scooby-Doo. Daphne had a butler called Jenkins and, you know, she'd like uh, uh, step in some mud or something and then scream and... Uh, call out for Jenkins and he'd just appear out of nowhere and bring her new shoes or ho- her whole wardrobe or like there was a episode where Scooby ran to uh, Daphne's house and then came back with her whole closet and whatever you know like uh, so that that show in itself was just very out there and cartoony and very exaggerated animation too and so uh, going into this movie I expected a lot of that and kind of their personalities, too, because, like, you know, like you were saying, when they were in the treehouse and Daphne was like, line up for inspection or whatever. I was like, yeah, that's Daphne as a kid. She was so, like, girly, girly, you know, can't get dirty. If anything happens to my wardrobe, then we can't solve a mystery and very sassy and stuff. And so uh, for me personally, you know, I just went into this movie expecting a long pup named scooby-doo episode and i think it worked a little bit better for me obviously it's still not one i'm gonna go back to a lot because i don't even love love a pup named scooby-doo i know a lot of people are very nostalgic for that series and that series i watched uh almost every day growing up right before school i'd watch it as i'm waiting for the bus to come pick me up or whatever but uh going back to it as an adult um i know scooby-doo is repetitive in itself But A Pup Named Scooby-Doo, for me particularly, is a very repetitive series. Like, they have to do every same joke in every episode. Whereas I feel like, you know, in other Scooby series, there's these handful of jokes or gags that they'll do, you know, within the series. But they sit and mix them up throughout the episode, so they're not doing the same ones every episode. And uh, A Pup Named Scooby-Doo is just one I cannot consistently rewatch all the time because i'm like it's to me it's the same thing over and over which is really saying something for scooby-doo but there's kind of my two cents on your question yeah that's that's interesting as well and like what you said with um daphne screaming lineup for inspection i did like how gray managed to switch up their voice acting in this because it seems like they're very much channeling another one of their characters which i think is vicky from fairly odd parents i don't know Mm -hmm. if you've seen that but it's very very reminiscent of that and for all it's almost it took me out at first because that screaming of lineup for inspection instantly took me back to that show it very much showed that she could still adapt that version of Daphne but into her own kind of area of comfort as well which I did like it wasn't you know I didn't instantly hear that and again like it distinctly wasn't Daphne's voice but I do like that kind of different take on her yeah I mean I put in my notes that by the case scene I Daphne's voice I'd started to like it again to me it was starting to resemble what I associate with Daphne's voice a little bit more I think maybe it was it created an impact at the start and then relaxes a little bit yeah it definitely starts off very very strong almost like it was just recorded in chronological order and they were just like right i need to channel this i need to channel that and then it kind of blended and found a nice balance between the two which i think is an impressive within and of itself because i think a lot of like voices take even series to get to that stage of comfort but I think Grey managed to do it quite quickly. Again, I don't know how long they were filming the voices here. It may have been, you know, a month, it may have been more, but it's impressive nonetheless. Um, oh, I don't know, though. I, I kind of don't want to upset anyone. But I, and I think I've put this in my notes, I did feel that there was just something off with how Frank was doing a younger Fred. And mm. I just don't know how to describe it. It just seemed... Like, I was, it almost like, 
you know when you kind of try and find clips on YouTube from a movie and they're trying to avoid copyright, so they slow it down loads or rate, you know, make it more high pitch. It was just something like that where it kind of unsettled me a bit to the point where I didn't dislike it or hate it, but it was very yeah. jarring. Almost like the first time I heard Kate McCucci as um, Velma in Sword and the Scoob, it just took me out and it... It was like, I need some time here. This yeah. is the process I need to adjust to. Like I said, that's why I think when I heard Matthew Lillard's voice, I was just like, okay, good. There's one I recognise. Like, because to me, it wasn't Frank Welker as fresh. It didn't sound anything like them. Like you said, it sounded like some strange, almost distorted version. The same, well, Velma's voice was replaced completely. Obviously, Grey was trying to change Daphne slightly to make that younger, like, pop named Scooby-Doo one. And I was like, okay. <laughs> this needs time. But then we move on. We meet a Dr. Escobar and Shirley. And Fred sticking to standard formula is like, oh, yay, Shirley, woo. Oh, she smells nice, yay. I was like, <laughs> okay, I thought we'd made you younger now, but still no i i kind of did start to like that though because for all i i wasn't the type of audience or the type of person to appreciate frank's performance fully in this i could almost tell that he was having a blast recording these lines like i think he definitely had fun with it and that's very important because if he sounded different and bored or embarrassed to be there i think it would have made this movie cringy to the point of like i couldn't even watch it even for the podcast but i think he, because he genuinely sounded like he was having a good time with it and they were very much fitting into formulas and tropes that i was familiar with again like for all i don't like it it was introducing a kind of female character into the show so fred could go oh my gosh look at her and daphne could go oh wow why are you being such a such a typical guy so it's not my favorite trope but it's something similar that i can kind of connect like oh okay so this is the start of that i guess then chronologically <laughs> which was fun to see and then here's where they incorporate the lyrics into here comes somewhere you were like yes and you got the instrumental right Woo! and you kind of had your happy moment and then they go into that chase scene like that song's what they use for the chase they try and recreate that standard hallway sequence that's quite iconic to scooby-doo and i'll admit they did well with that there was that scene was good. The only part I didn't like is when they were speaking. No, like, this, you're right. The chase scene is done fantastically. And I do just wish there was a bonus feature behind the scenes or even just a few stills of just taking a few steps back from the camera and seeing how all the puppets moved and how they got them to replicate certain scenes, where they needed to edit things out. That would have been absolutely fascinating, even as its own little mini documentary. Um, an issue is, is that I feel like they've been very, very brave with their choice of songs because my happiest moment was literally just dancing to the Here Comes Summer song. And so for all they've kind of done the job at first, they've kind of got me excited. Ultimately, it's just serving to remind me of a film that I'd rather be watching instead of this one. Yeah, because they reuse a lot of songs in this, don't they? And each time you're a bit like, oh... Could be watching that movie and enjoy this song. Could be watching that movie to enjoy this song. Uh, yeah, I agree with you on that. And then they like start to escape the cave, which is when I feel like they almost do that courage the cowardly dog thing, as we see in Straight Out of Nowhere, where it's kind of like they have a Scooby snack and then they change form completely into a different shape. They become a bowling ball. They do Ooh. it later on where you can have a snack and they become mm. a rocket. And to me, that's... Just exactly what they're doing straight out of nowhere with courage, isn't it? It it uh, it reminded me a little bit too much of Shaggy and Scooby get a clue, and that was the series that that assassinated my passion for Scooby Doo for eight or so years. So, um, uh, it it was kind of unsettling to see the like Scooby all of a sudden get these worldly powers but i think the way they do it i think it worked to be honest like the fact that they could get a bowling ball variant almost and just change up the dynamic because there has to be a way to break down these barriers 
and it doesn't just look silly like a puppet is just bashing into foam and breaking through it. Like, it's a creative way to make them remove an obstacle. But again, a theme that I think I'm going to have consistently throughout this movie is that they do just seem to be putting in obstacles out of nowhere because without them, the movie would be about 10 minutes long. See, I'm thinking at this point, could they have made this movie as a standard animation? And no. I think they could have. I think they... Well, again, though, it would have been 10 minutes long. Okay, they could have made an episode, but... Yeah. It didn't need to be puppetry, is what I'm kind of getting at, at this point. They do, like, a little scene next where they're inside the lighthouse and they look up and there's that spiralization thing, and that's kind of a nice graphic, but again, it's kind of moving away from the puppeteering bit. And then Shaggy goes up as a cracker that's, like, magically materialised from somewhere to unmask that it's Stu, the pizza delivery person. Oh god, you're going way too quickly for me. Am I? I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm lost. I'm lost. Um, I think it's because I literally just like summarized the plot as quickly as I could. Like, eh, not following. I mean, that, <laughs> that's it, really, though. Just summarizing. Well, not summarizing, but it's almost like a play-by-play. And I guess the meet the creepy lighthouse keeper that I kind of didn't mention. But again, but again, they don't do anything. They just, just stand there. They're almost classic puppetry and the gang's like a reimagined version of the gang and it's almost like they've just reused old Sesame you know, Sesame Street yeah. set pieces and put these people in it. But, and then the title, but like it just rolls to these weird titles. As soon as it's been unmasked, it replays the initial titles and we were there like, okay, is that it? Or is it done? Like, I, like, wrote, like, capitalised, like, pass in my book. Like, okay, that's it, it's done. Passing this one, it's absolutely awful. I'm never watching it again. It's done, like, hallelujah. And then it goes into something else, and it's like, okay, is is this just, like, replaying now it's finished? Has it just rolled over? Is this episode two? Is it episode Yeah, is that's what I weird? thought at first. Like, they did, because it was, I think I was aware that it was meant to be a TV show. I kind of figured that maybe, like, they sometimes do with cancelled things. Like, I think for the second or third Cruel Intentions movie, they just got, like, three episodes of a scrapped, like, series together and made it, like, a sequel film. And I kind of thought that that's what they'd done here. They'd, like, got three... You know of the old of the scrapped puppet episode and combined it into one story, but no. I mean, my notes here say episode two with a question mark. Please don't continue. Although I do want to say that the the, <laughs> the kind of interlude seemed very reminiscent of a pup named Scooby Doo. As I think there was this one that I was watching, very funny, like very fun s- sequence. But it's that the Iceman, and in between the the chases, they do have these little dance scenes. So. That was kind of fun, and it wasn't sad, though, but it was very much raising me up, like, oh my gosh, is that it already? Wow, that's crazy. Okay, we survived. But then, like we say, it kind of goes into this weird little part two. But, Smash, what are you thinking so far, say, from Scooby's transformation and obviously this this kind of dance sequence? So the transformations, again, comes from a pup named Scooby-Doo, because they would... Uh, in that series, they give him a Scooby snack, and then uh, he could transform. And there was like this. Sometimes they'd sit and use it almost in every episode. They give him a Scooby snack, and he'd like just fall in love or something, and like turn into a rocket and explode in the sky. And then he'd come floating down, and someone would catch him, and he'd be like, "Okay, I'm ready," and stuff. So again, that that stems from a pup named Scooby Doo. I. I really don't know why they didn't just, like, make this a pup named Scooby-Doo movie or something. But, uh, anyway, then, with, the, like, the random dance sequence, I, too, thought it's like, oh, yay, it's over, now we're just having a dance party, and then the credits will roll. And then it was, like, so started going, you know, forward into this next story, and yet it... So, well... The thing is, though, it's the same night. It still connects to the yeah. previous story. But why was there a random dance sequence in between? I was like, again, this was like two episodes split. And they were just like trying to make it into a movie to 
sell it, you know? Like, I, it didn't make sense to me. It was kind of annoying. I was like, just just take out the dance sequence and just fade out into black and then come back or something. Yeah, I mean, I was like, when the when the dancing started and I thought it was finished, I was like, we didn't find out where the treasure was. What was the treasure? Wait a minute, I don't care. If I don't need to continue watching it, if we're leaving it there, I'm not going to complain. Yeah. It's fine. It's done. I almost felt like Rick Roll. I'd like, rather, the movie I'd rather knew it was not torturing. know. I'd rather never know what, what the treasure was or where it was and let this just be done. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was just a troll. Like they, it, It's like the, the, the movie knew that we were waiting for it to end. And then it, it was like, yay, Like we're kind of doing a false end. Like They do like oh. the kind of scooby doo we do oh. thing. Then they kind of have the sequence play there. Like, the kind of dance, and it is all just a bit odd. Like, I don't quite know how to describe it, but I don't know. I don't know. Okay, cut. What is going on here? Hello? Hello? Oh. Hello? It's not the one Let's try closing that. Okay, it's still recording. Let's just open up Discord here. Yeah. Hello? Okay, there we go. Ah, uh, I don't know what happened there. That was kind of freaky. Where did you hear <laughs> up to? Do you remember? Because I think JB was going along and then it made a little noise. Uh, last I was hearing was Millie talking. Oh my gosh. But I, I guess to summarise, like, kind of our thoughts on that section at least, in terms of the dance sequence, it seemed very unself-aware, like, that we were kind of just going to be watching along and having the time of our lives. But when they kind of had that false ending, the movie was so unself-aware that it didn't predict that people were actually going to be relieved when, like, they ended it earlier. Yeah. It's, it's, mm-hmm. I know. Yeah, like, JB was just saying that, like, it almost rubs it in your face, like, you're wanting this movie to be over so badly. They then let you think it's finished, just to them be like, ha, no, that's just the halfway <laughs> mark we're doing this all over again, yay! Like, I don't know if Pretty it's like a, like, a harsh oh. prank to the parents that, like, have to watch this with their kids, but... Yeah, JB said to me at the end of this, like, if we have, when we have children, if they, if they, like, when we introduce them to Scooby-Doo, they come across this, and they like it, will you sit and watch it with them? I was like, look, I'd do anything for my children. I'll put it on the TV for them and I'll sit and read a book, but I am under no circumstances watching this. No way. Like, Just put it up high in a cupboard where they'll never find it and act like it doesn't exist. Yeah, like, you know, uh, the the company's tried to do a good enough job of acting like it never happened. I feel like I need to yeah, do the true. same. Like hide it like Jumanji or something. Just, just yeah, it's like, this was, this was the year that Scooby-Doo missed. There wasn't a movie at this one. This this was just forgotten. I mean, that's a good question. Did this take the place of one of the annual films? I believe it technically did. I mean, the... Uh, what was the last movie we did? Oh, Lord. It was Mask, uh, Mask of the Blue, of the Blue Falcon. Falcon. That one came out the same year, but it came out earlier in the year. Yeah, so we're at like two movies a year at this point? Yeah, you. That's we. Yeah, we are. Oh no! Just kidding. I'm looking back at it. So actually, no. So they did Mask of the Blue Falcon in February. This one came out in July. Then actually, the following month, Stage Fright came out. Okay. So at least we weren't like deprived. Deprived. <laughs> yeah. 
I mean, um, that's fair enough, I guess. In a way, like, they've not used a slot. Like, they kind of experimented differently, but they did it in their own time. I suppose that makes me feel a bit better about it, to be honest. But, but we'll see. We'll see. So... I wonder we... if the reason they put the music in between was to make it feel more like episodes. Like I said, in my notes, I've put it as episode two. Almost to introduce the concept of it being a series. That's maybe, what I'm thinking, maybe. honestly. Or even just. But still, like JP said, it's like they didn't realize we were dying for this movie to be done. But I didn't know what <laughs> yeah. to expect. Like they, they start it up again with um Stu the Pizza Man on TV, and I'm thinking, even like I, I even got to the point where I was thinking, okay, maybe this is just a quirky post credit scene where like Stu's just gonna appear on TV, make a joke, and then that's gonna be it. Like. Yeah, Honestly. but no, they see Shirley and her mum out looking for clues and stuff. <laughs> There's a hot dog stand in the middle of nowhere, just in some random forest. Okay. Although I think I called this relatively early, because um, the kind of main villain of this, apart from the pirate pirate, was Captain Gnarly Beard. And their kind of unique trait is that their beard just stinks of absolute garbage. <laughs> and when Fred is going on about, oh, Shirley smells nice, Shirley smells like this, for all it's contrasting, like, he's not like, oh, that Shirley just stinks of, like, of rubbish, it's all, it's always that, that tie-in, there's, like, a strong scent on this person, and obviously the villain is notorious for having a strong scent, you know, even if it's positive and negative. So I think we set it up fine. Um, like, did you guess Millie or were you just not switched on at this point? I was I was crying. I just I just they'd got my hopes up that it was done. <laughs> like I, I just was so uninvested, it was unbelievable. And so then they just go up to the lighthouse, they count a few steps, X marks the spot, Shaggy and Scooby fly off onto a boat where they're working for Captain Smelly Beard, and yeah, that's that's how it's progressing. Well, I just think a lot of it is just to waste time. Like the, you know, I think the musical sequence was nothing more than just to like add in some watch hours. Yeah, like, it's like, oh, we're classifying this as a movie. Let's see if we can at least meet the sixty-minute mark. I think that's all it is. I think that's what the majority of the movie is. It's just wasting time and. It's a shame because I do feel like if they just released a mini series of maybe five or so episodes and they were maybe 12 minutes long each, I think they could have had a very bizarre but overall nice little mini series for kind of younger audiences, for people just interested in puppets and sets in general. And instead, it's just they've tried to overinflate it to something it isn't. And. I almost do feel bad for them, because they really did try and market it, it seems. They definitely weren't lazy with the set design. They've just... I think they just went about it in the completely wrong way. Well, Smash the Deli, Scooby-Doo can be repetitive. Like, when... You know that TV show that you introduced me to, Ghost Whisperer? Yeah. You literally said that formula is freak of the week. Every week, there's a new ghost. She helps them cross over. Scooby-Doo, very similar. Every, every week, it's a new freak of the week. It's... Who we, who are they gonna unmask this time? And that's it. That's the formula. But it's worked. It had worked for over like what at that point, like fifty years. Like you don't need to try and do something different. Why are you trying to do something so drastically different if you know it's working this well? Like when the views were like dropping and Zombie Island was some radical introduction. It's like. They didn't try and completely change it then, so why did they need to completely change it now? Like, yeah. I mean, I kind of disagree. It, it, I just wish that the change in direction was was different, something that made sense. Like, I wasn't... Like, from what I'm aware, in 2013, puppets weren't this new trend. Like, I'd have even have forgiven them if, say... And obviously, this wasn't in 2013. Like, the Muppets maybe just it was, come out. But, like, the, like you know, Scooby-Doo meets, meets the guy from Gangnam Style or something. Like, hopping on a trending topic would have made sense to, like, revitalise something or try something new. And it's creative, but again, I just don't feel that they had any reason to believe 
that it would work. Whereas if they put the same marketing into a Lego, the Lego movies that we're going to get onto, I'd understand that, you know, Lego is really popular and obviously the Lego movie did really well. There's reason to believe that that movie would be a success. And if they wanted to use the Lego movie as of Scooby to try and convince Lego to team up with them to make a Lego series of Scooby-Doo, again, that'd be fine. And it would also sell some, some sets, some toys, you know, joy all around. But I don't know who they thought that they were appealing to with, mm. with the puppets, apart from the little kids, which at the end of the day, that's the kind of audience that they would ideally go for. But they do say, you know, you, you can't be mad because you used to like something as a kid and it's not aged with you. I almost feel like this aged down. Like, I used to be scared of the Scooby-Doo Where Are You series when I was growing up, when I was about five or six. Like, there was only a few episodes I'd watch, you know. I, I'd, I'd pretty much... And you, you know me. I used to watch all the scenes of Daphne and then, then close my little eyes when, like... The, the phantom virus or whatever used to come on. I was a very simple boy. But that was me. I was scared for the most part. I think if I was that age and I even saw this then, I would have gone, right, this is a bit too This silly. is ridiculous. <laughs> and then they do the little dig it song, which again is just to reuse, like, repeat. The gang's all here. Da, da, da. Um, what's this? Scooby snack turns Scooby into a rocket. A rocket, yeah, to to escape from from Gnarly from Gnarly Beard. Yeah, I've already said I don't like it. They unmask Shirley, like Big Shock. Yeah, big surprise. <laughs> JB didn't call that ten minutes ago. And then wow. it turns out that the treasure that we've just sat and been tortured for an hour for is beard products. To be fair, the Dr. Escobar finds a teddy bear. Yeah? Yeah. <laughs> Admittedly, I wasn't expecting that Dr. Escobar lighthouse keeper little... I like that, though, to right. be honest. That was honestly my favourite part. Like, Dr. Escobar <laughs> is actually quite an interesting character in that they were so obviously a shady character in the whole film, but then they kind of weren't. They kind of just had their own separate agenda. So is it just that them to have two messed up children, like, that are just... Jesus. ...looking at, like... Two messed up children? Pretending to be, like, pirates and Oh, yeah, that's true, because and... they're siblings, aren't they? Yeah. So is it just that they were, like, so in love that they just left the kids to impersonate, like, Polly the Parrot and... Pirate Pete and stuff. I guess they're just dysfunctional. I don't know what's wrong with them. Because they must be their parents, right? Because Shirley's not just going to be walking around with some random woman. Yeah, you'd well, like to think. I thought initially that um, almost Shirley was was a protege or like a, a student. I don't know how to describe. It. You know, like in Fantasy or like how Windsor yeah. was to to the main archaeologist in that movie. But then by the way that she scolds them. It very much seems like a mother and daughter. Yeah. Like, oh, you've been a very silly girl, and well, you know, all yeah. like words along those lines. So basically, they've just got two terribly rebellious children, and then <laughs> we just right. see Scooby and Shaggy in the bath together. Just like, okay, please tell me it is done this time. Let Let's not just let's not ro run that little dance sequence again and move on to episode three i mean the abracadabra do song plays again during the credits but again it just reminds me of a movie that i wish that i was watching more yes i completely agree um Smash, i'm good with that uh, what do you feel what would you think about the whole shirley reveal and dr escobar's romantic <laughs> wonderful endeavors? parenting skills <laughs> two children <laughs> you know this whole like movie I feel like there really was not a mystery. It was just like, there's just these random characters that pop up and you maybe see each of them once or twice and then you get to the end and it's like, oh yeah, remember those characters you saw like 20 minutes ago? It's them. And so them in particular, I don't know. It was just, to me it was easy and they were just weird and I really didn't like any of the side characters. Yeah, I mean, I mean, 
I feel like that summarizes it. We can go, we can go just to the smash our past like section here. <laughs> I got to a stage and I was like, "What the heck have we just seen? Like, how in the same series have we gone from reviewing something like Zombie Island to to this?" And I was like, "Jesus." <laughs> That's just, you just get sick of it, don't you? <laughs> well, just in case anybody watching this hasn't guessed the reviews already, JB, <sighs> Mystery Map, Smash or Pass. Well, look, to be honest, and I'm going to be serious with this. This is the real mystery no, here. No, no, come on, I'm going to be serious with this. I genuinely can tell everyone listening to this that I have actually no pleasure in, in saying this. I really wanted to be the person that would come onto this podcast and say, look, you know, I get annoyed when people don't like it, like it's, you know, something just because it's in a different medium, like I've been the biggest defender or something that we've got going on now. Like, what if the first animated Marvel show and people just switch off on something like that because it's animated and obviously the rest of the Marvel Universe isn't. And so I thought that that's what I was going to do here as well. I was going to say, look, just imagine it's animated and you'll be fine. But I just can't. I thought that this was... The, this is the worst movie we've reviewed in this series, and I can confidently say that. This movie reminded me of being in a toy shop with absolutely no money. Okay, initially there's a lot that I can look around and appreciate. I can say, oh my gosh, that's cool. I didn't know they could do that. Oh wow, well, you know, I didn't hear about that before. But ultimately, I'm just walking around the place sulking because there's so much more fun that I could be having if I could actually take something away from it. And ultimately, there was just a lot of there was a lot of visuals, and unfortunately, just no substance to it. So, and and, and I am I am sorry because I really did think that I was gonna come into this movie being the one person that would like it, but unfortunately, I'm gonna have to pass on Scooby Doo Adventures Mystery Map. What about you, Millie? Okay, well, I can honestly say I agree with pretty much everything you've just said. This is the worst scooby-doo thing i've seen in my entire life i started watching scooby-doo when i was about four and i can honestly say this is the worst scooby thing i've ever seen i feel confident it's the worst thing out there so i know it's only just going to get better with the other movies we're about to review the puppet style just i hated it i felt really awkward when they were talking because their mouths didn't really move and it it, it just it, or at least it didn't move right and it was just it was so awkward it was so painful there was that thing where they literally like played with you in the middle and was like oh i know well, let's make them think it's finished and i was like so happy it's like oh no we're just continuing on no it, it's horrendous it was awful i will i can like put like I literally i say i'm saying this like on the channel like I, I bet the channel that I will never, ever watch this again. I'll never want to watch this again. I'd happily, like Smash said, like not adding it to his collection for so long, I'd happily remove it for our collection if it wasn't for the sake of, like... Like, if it was that we just downloaded the movies, it'd be deleted, it'd be gone, it's done. It's literally just so we're like, oh, yeah, we've got the complete collection, woo, great. That is literally the only reason that I'm like, oh, yeah, we'll be keeping the DVD just for the sake of, like part of the collection it was awful and if they did make that series then this smash or pass series would definitely be finishing with the movies because i wouldn't be like okay i want to i want to continue like it's literally put me off the idea of watching a pup named scooby-doo i've not seen any of that series really and after watching this and hearing some of the stuff that said i genuinely just don't want to this is for me the biggest mistake that was ever made with scooby-doo and i think it was awful that's a complete pass okay smash on that but happy note i guess i haven't asked you how many times have you watched this and is it a smash or a pass i think in total okay actually to be fair i've probably seen this a good like 10 times but that's because uh one of my nephews loves this one ah. and so you know it's like whenever uh, he's like with me at my house or whatever he like you know wants to watch that one and whatever and um so that's like the only reason i watched it really more than maybe anyone should <laughs> um, the music's available on the other movies watch them instead 
Right? Like, dude, you can jam away with on a better move. But, uh, you know, with how long it took me to even get this one. I will say, though, like, I'm able to watch this one, and it's like, okay, I can get through it. Uh, there's a series called Shaggy and Scooby-Doo Get a Clue that I admittedly mm. still cannot get past the first three episodes. And so I'm like, in a way, I guess this is better than that. Yeah, At I least, you know, know just from what I've seen. I don't know that. if that's when the call was breaking up, but JB said that there was parts of this that reminded him of that. And he said that's literally why he didn't watch Scooby-Doo for eight years. That was his like turning point where it's just like I'm I'm done. It's not yeah. for me anymore. Mm -hmm. Uh but I mean it's no surprise to anyone. I have to pass this one too. Do, do not watch it unless you just are that bored. I guess that's something that I guess I want to make clear now, but it's pretty obvious. If you are listening to this and you do like this movie, like, full respect, because everyone's taste is different, but I really want to know what you enjoy about the movie, so please make sure to, like, comment that, because I really do just want to speak to someone that does really like this movie, and I kind of hear their point of view on it, because I'm interested, because that's just the type of person that I am. Yeah, but... JB balances us out very well. Like, I'm really just abrupt and like, oh, well, this is my views, and that's it. Whereas, yeah, you're very, like... Okay, well, let, let, let's let see a bit more. So, if there is anyone that likes this, it would be very interesting to hear why. But I guess now we should move on to some community news, if anyone Ooh. has any. I guess we'll start with Smash, because I've got, I think... I'm taking our community news. Okay, I, I, well, we've got one <laughs> community news. I don't know if if Smash has any community news at all. Um, I mean, I, I have some news, but I don't know if it's what you guys were going to bring up oh actually yeah there is more news isn't there what's your news smash yeah, okay okay uh the scooby-doo reunion special yeah. did you guys see that there was like a post on some more information about it but i haven't read it in depth so if you want to keep the lovely viewers informed we'll definitely be interested to hear that yeah so they're doing a scooby-doo reunion special for the 52nd anniversary which they're kind of late with that but it's fine um so it's going to air later this month i believe on october 29th uh on the cw and then they're going to do an encore presentation early november on cartoon network but uh yeah we basically got a premise it's going to be animated and it's basically going to be about the gang going around the lot of warner brothers and talking about their past mysteries and their you know all their adventures throughout the years but then while uh you know going about they're going to have a mystery that they have to solve on the lot of warner brothers all while running into a bunch of guest stars who um either have starred in scooby-doo projects who or have worked on them like tony cervoni is going to be on it who directed scoob uh but also was involved with other scooby-doo projects and stuff uh, the biggest thing we're all wondering is if uh, actual Scooby-Doo characters are going to be brought back because they're calling it a Scooby-Doo reunion. It's, uh, it's called Scooby-Doo, Where Are You Now? Uh, and we're all just like really hoping that at least in some form they're going to like bring back Scooby-Dumb, Scooby-D, maybe Scrappy. Scrappy, you know, <laughs> like, like we're like, OK, this is fun and all that you're bringing all these guest stars on here but what we really want is these scooby-doo characters that we haven't you know seen for decades at this point and so you know that's something to look forward to to watch at the end of this month uh just in time you know for the spooky holiday wow. i mean there's some characters from like Alien Invasion that would be invaded that would be great to see oh, back with the JB. Right? Crystal and Amber, right? Or even Lester. Please. Yeah, get, I was thinking get, Lester. Get Lester. Lester in for like some Area 51 interrogation. Like like post question so I hear you yeah, have pictures. Like, yeah, I've been with the aliens for the last 30 <laughs> years. Yay! Did they experiment on you. God. 
That's <laughs> mad. I mean, honestly, I think the Scooby community would manage to break the internet if Scrappy came out. Yeah, I mean, it'd be oh, positive yeah. or negative, the internet would be broken. Yeah, and it's so split down the middle. Like, I don't think there's really many people that's like, yeah, Scrappy's okay. It's like, oh, they're so cute. Or, they're plain evil. I just want, like, and everyone would hate this because I know it's the most, well, probably one of the most unpopular iterations of Scrappy. But I just want a two minute short of Scrappy's flight from Spooky Island to jail or like wherever he gets sent to. Just Drill. make it like explicit or whatever you need to do. I just want to hear him like ranting and raving. That would be amazing. Who was the most voice in Scrappy then? It was Scott, Scott Ennis, and wasn't Yeah, it? because I remember yeah. them. Were they speaking with Nikki Blake? Like they tried to do that, you know, like where they kind of bleep a lot out at the end. And they were yeah. like, okay, this isn't... And he'd said that the producers had said to him, this isn't running well when you try and, like, stop. You do actually need to just... You need to do the full thing. You need to just swear and we're just going to have to, like, edit round <laughs> you. We just need to get it, like, to sound right. I'll just release so he that audio. he was there on, like, the set of Scooby-Doo, just, like, swearing his head off, just like, oh and Jeffy. Or just release <laughs> release the James Gunn cut of Scooby Doo two thousand and two. Right, JB, you you're done. You're <laughs> done. No, no, That's I, the end of the episode. There was very you. little that I wouldn't give up for that cut. Like, come on, man. And he's just done the Suicide Squad, right? Come, come on, James Gunn. Just release it, man. Please, please be a friend. Be a friend. Be a pal. Um, You're already a creep enough without that being released. Stop no, 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 it. I'm not a creep. Um, what else? There's the more news. news in that. I think as of putting this out yesterday, um, the soundtrack for Scooby Doo, The Temple of Gold, like the kind of live tour, should have been released. So look forward to hearing that. I don't know how they're going to release right. it, if they're going to make it a CD or if it's going to be on iTunes, but it should be fun uh, with us. Tonight, well, I guess it should be out for you guys at this point, but uh, the album should be out digitally for you to listen to at least. JB is on his mm -hmm. phone. He's finding I it. Check. I guess you and can. I'm I guess... contemplating doing a reaction to it. Oh. I guess while JB is researching it, the other bit of community news we have is, as everyone like kind of knows, about two weeks ago when the Frank Welker thing was kind of sold for us, we were a bit like, eh. and that would obviously be this weekend this would be that would have happened on the day this goes out right jb which one? Oh my gosh that's sad yeah, yeah. it would have so oh. today would have been the day that we were like going no, to frank welker but um jb managed to find on the internet that freddie prince jr is accepting like send-ins until the 15th? It's the 10th, I think. Well, the, the sales cutoff is the 10th. Yeah, so and then it needs to be there for the 15th. As of this coming out, you do have a day, maybe more, because we're in the UK. So, like, you probably have some more time if you did want to do that. But the cutoff point is the 10th of October, October. 2021. Um, and all the information will be on the GalaxyCon website if you do want to do so that. So, we're, like waking up at like 7 a.m 6 a.m tomorrow to try and get like the world's fastest shipping to america for the funko pop box yeah it's gonna be it's a bit of a supplement i mean yeah frank Wilk is obviously like the original and current and just everything although but you know jb likes to point out that freddie prince is a man of substance but what will be awesome though is when we meet Matthew Lillard and like if obviously the Freddie Prince Jr. gets there in time, they'll literally be like two of the live action actors like there. You're still not getting anywhere near Gala, you can forget it. No, no, you're right. But, but <laughs> still, still, still like I can dream. I can the security's like heard you on this podcast and the restraining order's already in progress. I don't think it is. I think it's I think they've cancelled it. So yeah, the soundtrack doesn't seem to be released for us yet, but I guess that's everything. I'm trying to think if there's anything else. I can't think of any more news. Um but yeah, so again, GalaxyCon, I'll try and link that in the description. Again though, there's only like a day still left if you wanna do that. Do it now. But regardless, keep an eye on the GalaxyCon website because there's a lot of things that they've got going on. And obviously, because a lot the majority of our audience are in America, you can literally do it for a fraction of the price. From what I can recall, Freddie Prince Jr. was eighty dollars to send in your own item to get it autographed. Well, then it's like 50 shipping back for us, so... 
it's a oh yeah it's it's ex yeah just I I don't want to if you're in the UK um the UK is just we're gonna so start a support group so if you have purchased this <laughs> and you're in the UK just DM us and we'll have a little cry together but we'll also celebrate because it's happy times. We'll celebrate if it gets there in time. <laughs> if it doesn't, I'll be I'll be sad. But yeah, but we'll see. Anyway, so wrapping up next week, we will be reacting to Scooby Doo Stage Fright. Yeah, which I'm actually really yeah. excited for. To be honest, I, I think, think we've heard some good yeah. things about this one. Yeah, after this movie, I I'm very happy that we're going to move on to Stage Fright. I I mean, uh, yeah, it's I a good think... one to redeem us back into yeah. some good Scooby. Yes. My brain didn't feel like my own after watching Mystery Map, so I do need to <laughs> I need to reclaim it. Anyway, we hope you've enjoyed this. Like we said, we will be back next week where we'll be looking at Scooby Doo Stage Fright. So make sure to subscribe to that. That is obviously on the JB and Millie channel. And of course, Smash as well. Subscribe to their channel. They are always up to date with everything kind of Scooby and it's just a great channel to kind of stay in the loop with everything Scooby as well. And as always, the information for that will be down in the description. Yeah, like if you subscribe to us, there's no reason to not subscribe to Smash because he's he, he's got a nicer voice than me. And, and that's, <laughs> that's saying something in it because I've got the accent on that. Wow, that was a lovely, a lovely way of speaking, JB. Congratulations. That's all right. So, yeah, please make sure to like, comment and subscribe to JB and Millie and of course Smash. Hey. Woo. Woo.